Welcome to Syntax, a Generative Introduction, 4th Edition. My name is Andrew Carney. I'm a professor of linguistics at the University of Arizona. I'm the author of your textbook, and I'll be leading you through this series of video tutorials. In the previous two sets of videos, we talked about head movement and DP movement as two examples of transformations which modify the structure of clauses. In this unit, we're going to start talking about WH movement, which is our third and final kind of movement we're going to look at. WH movement um, plays out in a particular kind of question, although it also shows up in other constructions. In previous videos, we've talked about yes-no questions. Yes-no questions are questions that can be answered by yes, no, or maybe. So did you have the octopus? Yes or no. But you can't answer with a content word like dog. Have you eaten yet? Yes, no, maybe, but not apple. Um, WH questions, by contrast, are often called content questions because they are typically answered with a word that is contentful rather than yes, no. So who was here last week? Howard, that's a fine answer. If you answer no, then you're just rude. What do you have there? Nail clippers. If you answer yes, you're a jerk. WH questions are called WH questions because in English, they typically involve words that begin with the letters WH. Um, these are the words that uh, journalists refer to as the critical parts of figuring out how to write an article, the who, what, where, when, and why. Um, we have, uh, in English, a variety of these. We have uh, who and what, along with um, a complex structure like which book or whose book. And these are WH words, words that uh, form WH questions. Uh, which appear in argument position. So they appear in the specifier of TP or the complement of the verb or as the object of a preposition. Um, we also have a set that typically appear in adjunct positions. So a sister to, to a bar, a daughter of a bar by X bar theory. So these are uh, phrases like when, why, and how. How is the odd man out in English? But notice it still has a WH in it. And then we have uh, the where, and where can, uh, can appear both as an adjunct or as an argument. It can appear in both positions. Obviously, it goes with that, uh, without saying that WH uh, words are different in other languages. They don't have to begin with WH. Um, so, but we nevertheless call questions in other languages that refer to these notions as WH questions, even if the uh, words that indicate them are, do not, in fact, begin with WH. Okay, so um, let's talk briefly about what uh, moves in WH movement. Uh, first of all, this is a kind of phrasal movement. We know this um, because uh, we, we sort of want WH words like who and what to be full DPs. Um, one analysis is, of this is who and what are determiners themselves, and they take an empty noun phrase because we actually don't know the content of uh, these phrases. Um, so we would structure who and what like this, and it would be this whole DP that actually moves when you do WH movement. Um, the, say, the, the argument for this actually comes from uh, the fact that we have complex DPs like um, whose book or which book, where whose and which are clearly determiners, and they do in fact take a noun phrase uh, as a complement, except this noun phrase has content to it. Again, when we do WH movement, we move the whole thing. We don't just move this question word. We move the whole uh, phrasal structure, the whole DP. Notice you can even say, uh, in certain circumstances, things like what book. So what can indeed function just like who's and which. So when we're doing the movement, keep in mind we're moving the whole phrase, not just the, the head word. 
Um, now, there are some uh, items that never appear sort of phrasally, but nevertheless, we want to move the whole phrase. So we have where, and where is uh, tricky because where can be both uh, a determiner um, when it's an argument, and it can be um, some kind of adverbial phrase, as in where did John go? Um, John went home. So this is on the assumption that in uh, John went home, home is an AP. In X bar theory, this could also be a noun phrase or a, or a DP. So um, we could have the same structure for both. It's just that sometimes it's in an argument, some position, and sometimes it's in an adjunct position. Um, how, when, and why are usually adverbs. Um, so they, um, they position themselves as sister to V, um, sorry, sister to bar, daughter of bar, and um, we will typically treat them like this. Nevertheless, we want to be moving the whole phrase, not just the head word, because we're, this, we're moving phrases in other circumstances. Okay, so wh what's involved in the movement? So let's take a sentence like, I bought a book. The question form of this, the WH question form of this, is what did you buy? What we see here is we see an alternation in position. This should be familiar now from head movement and DP movement, that where you, when you have an alternation in position in an item, you uh, have evidence for the movement. So let's talk a little bit about where you move WH phrases from. So let's take the sentence, what did you say was hit? I've chosen this example because um, the case position and the thematic position in this sentence are different from one another. So um, let's take, uh, this is a passive, right? So uh, if it's John hit the ball, um, the theme gets assigned into this position, right? So it gets its theta roll here. Um, the, uh, this is a passive, so it wouldn't get its case here. And because what is a DP, it must have case. Uh, by the case filter. So just as all other DPs have case, what also has to have case? It doesn't get case in this position. It gets case in the specifier of the TP, as in the sentence, the ball was hit. So it gets its theta roll here, it gets its case here, and then it eventually moves up to the top of the sentence, and we'll talk about where it lands in a minute. So movement is always from a case position if the item you're moving is a DP. That's not as critical if the item you're moving is an adverb phrase, because adverb phrases don't require case. But if you're moving a DP WH phrase, then you have to move from the case position, because as it is, in fact, a DP, it must meet the, um, the case filter. Similarly, um, any kind of movement will actually start in the thematic position where it gets its theta roll. So in order, you always start in a thematic position. And if you have to, you move to a case position. And then after that, you do your all, all your WH movement. That order is quite strict. It's the only way in which you can satisfy the theta criterion, the case filter, and the, and the constraint that motivates WH movement. So where does it move to? Well, here we have the sentence, what have you seen? What we will notice about this sentence is that we in fact have subject ox inversion. So we have um, the auxiliary is appearing before the U. Um, in order for that to be true, we have to have had an instance of T to C movement. So the tense node has to have moved into the plus Q complementizer in order to get the subject ox order in English. U is in this position because it's its case position. But then where does what go? Well, one uh, claim we might make is that uh, it's moving to the one position in front of that inverted auxiliary, which is the specifier, the TP. So we move the what phrase into the specifier. Now, why would it do this? Why would you move a question word into the specifier of the TP? 
Well, remember, all of our movements are in fact motivated by some kind of requirement. So T to C movement, for example, is motivated by moving into the null question complementizer. Um, what we're going to claim here is that there is a similar feature on complementizers, um, which re requires that the WH word uh, has to get close to it. Um, so here's our tree. Um, we have the plus Q that motivates the T to C movement. And we also, this complementizer also says plus WH, which is I'm a WH element and I have to take a WH phrase in my specifier. What does this WH phrase do? This WH feature, I mean. Well, let's think about what complementizers are for. Complementizers type the clause. What I mean by that is they indicate whether something is a statement, minus Q, a, uh, a yes-no question, plus Q, and in this case, a WH question. So um, uh, you've got this feature plus WH. So the features on the complementizer serve to tell you what kind of CP you have, whether it's a yes-no question, a statement, um, uh, or a WH question, we will also we can also do things like claim that this is what happens in imperatives. That imperatives have a special kind of complementizer, and other kinds of um, structures where we're typing the clause, we're marking the clause as having a specific function, uh, have features on this complementizer. The one that that we care about here is plus WH. Plus Q motivates the head-to-head -head movement. Plus WH motivates the WH movement. So what kind of evidence do we have that there are, in fact, complementizers that are plus WH? Well, you'll recall when we talked about T to C movement, we talked about how Irish has um, special complementizers you use in yes-no questions. Well, guess what? You have special complementizers you use in WH questions, too. So in the sentence, who was in the room, KAV um, the we have the special particle um, that is used only in WH questions and related, um, and related uh, constructions like relative clauses, which we will talk a little bit later. As an aside, this L here is not pronounced. It's an indicator of a particular kind of consonant mutation. So if you're ever faced with Irish, you'll hear this word pronounced as a uh, K of E, where, where you don't pronounce this L. Nevertheless, the point of this is it is, in fact, a complementizer that shows up in precisely WH constructions. So, why do we move things? In head movement, we move things because verbs want to be near their tense node, right? We want to check the, the verb's tense features against the T node. We move T's to C's because we want to indicate a question, so when we have a, a plus Q complementizer. We do uh, NP movement in raising and passives because of the case filter, the, the requirement that uh, NPs or DPs require some kind of case feature. Why do we move WH elements? Um, we do this so that the WH phrase is in the specifier of the CP to check off that WH feature in the complementizer. Um, in every case, what we're doing is we're creating some kind of local configuration whereby the element, there's one element that's moving to be closer to another so they can check features. One more terminological point. Um, just as uh, DP movement um, is one name for the phenomenon we talked in the last set of videos, um, uh, has another name, which is A movement, which stands for argument movement. We have another uh, term that we use for describing WH movement. You will also find it in the literature called A bar movement. Um, it's effectively the same thing as WH movement. Um, there's a variety of subtypes. We've talked about uh, WH questions. It also seems to show up in topicalization and focalization and relative clause formation. So a bar movement is a, uh, a just another name for WH movement. So if you see that in the literature, that's what that is.